Wednesday, November 18, 1863. Lincoln's Safe. Rebels Retreat in Disarray. To dedicate the memory of those many thousands of brave souls who gave the ultimate sacrifice their lives in the recent Battle of Gettysburg, July 1 3, the local residents led by David Wills and the Pennsylvania government has dedicated their memories in a national cemetery situated upon the entire battleground covering 4,998 acres of Gettysburg National Military Park. In their memories, the Gettysburg National Cemetery Trust invited President Lincoln to officially dedicate and open the cemetery on Thursday, November 19, 1863. President Lincoln accepted. In the times of conflict, his travel plans were kept secret and there were many alternating plans which only a select few advisors knew the real plan but was it really kept that secretive one must wonder. It seems not as there had been a recent increase in rebel activity in and around the border states of West Virginia, Maryland, Virginia, and southern areas of Pennsylvania and the build-up in the west of elite rebel troops in and around Chickamauga September 19-20 and now reported digging in at Chattanooga whilst in the east, battles at Buckland on October 9 and Bristow on October 14 indicates they are planning something major for the winter campaign as rebel forces are confirmed at Fredericksburg south of Washington, D.C., no one again expected the Confederacy to invade the North again following Gettysburg how wrong could people be? It has even been reported in newspapers from New York regarding rebel activity led by General Joseph Shelby and other Confederate partisan ranger forces as far north as New York City and suspicious characters believed Confederate spies watching Fort Slocum and Elmira prison causing extra federal troops to be rushed north to New York City and drawing them away from other duties, but like a ghost. Shelby's forces vanished as quickly as they appeared in the north. Unstablished reports indicated Shelby as far south in Florida and as far west as Texas and north in the Dakota territories all at once and at the same time as he was seen in the region of New York. Were these just simple rumors to frighten the people of the north? But the events of Tuesday, November 17 of this year were no rumors. Even though President Lincoln's travel plans were supposed to be a secret, the events of that wet and miserable cold day in a small Pennsylvania township on the western banks of the Susquehanna River provided a weakness within the Northern Intelligence Service when rebel forces under the leadership of General Robert E. Lee had managed to muster a small army of between 1,000 and 1,300 crack troops from all over the Confederacy without been noticed. It would have taken weeks to plan and ship supplies for such an army this size and to add further insult to the Federals' cause, an established and experimental operational hydraulic mining system using high-pressure water to erode away the soil of the mountains and opening up the veins of gold within the MOMO mountain ranges away on the western bank of the Susquehanna River, for some time and ship the gold ore south to the rebels' capital of Richmond in Virginia by Federal Railways. Operated by a southern synthesizer Robert Hamilton, whom had established a plantation southeast of the settlement and under the watchful eyes of federal forces. This leaves the question how far does the Confederacy reach into Lincoln's government? The main question which seems to be asked by everyone in the North is was the increasing Confederate activity a decoy or a build-up for a second invasion of the North with the vast supplies of weapons from rifles and pistols to artillery pieces discovered at the Hamilton's plantation and where the outlaw act of slavery ripe by the Confederate synthesizers. So the question is how did the rebels able to get this vast supply of weapons so far north without detection or anyone knowing and is this bloody war really needed should the north accept succession of the south and allow them to form their own nation as the war now seems to be moving further north and the federal forces under incompetent leadership and without the will to win, fails to defeat smaller armies of the enemy. The answer came in the early hours of the morning of Tuesday November 17. 1863 when President Lincoln's train pulled into the siding of Jetina Junction at around 4.45 m that cold and wet morning to fill with wood and water for the conclusion of the journey to Gettysburg, President Lincoln was hoping to slip in and slip out of the town without a fuss but the locals had other ideas. It seemed hundreds of people had traveled to the small unknown town to see their commander-in-chief and for many to continue on to Gettysburg. Scores of trains filled all sidings for 20 to 30 miles around. The small community of around 200 residents had swollen to 2,000 with many coming from as far as New York, Boston, Washington, and Philadelphia in the east to Chicago and Pittsburgh in the west. 
This did not include the thousand-plus federal troops who had also detoured to be at Jedna Junction before moving on to their assigned destinations and to continue the war. The crowd wanted to see President Lincoln and against his advisers, President Lincoln left the safety of his carriage to greet the people, unaware that the celebration was to turn sour when partisan rangers under William Quantrill hit the town from the north and a smaller raiding party under Colonel John Mosby attacked from the south, cutting off any chance of Lincoln's train from leaving the town of Jedna Junction. But unlike other raids carried out by these two guerrilla units in the border regions, the locals united with the gathered federal forces, and supported by the gathered Native American tribes of the Sioux, Cheyenne, Comanche and Apache Indians along with the local Delaware tribe that made Jedna Junction their home and with quick action by the 9th Colored Cavalry under Colonel Edward Hatch who joined the skirmish, drove the rebels from the town towards the nearby trading post. These actions of these two renegade partisan rangers bands alerted the federal leadership of an even more serious threat and the Lee's initial plans to capture President Lincoln. The brilliant leadership of Major General Ulysses Grant, the hero of Vicksburg, deployed his initial smaller force to counter-attack the advancing rebels who were encircling the town of Jedna Junction from all directions as word went out for reinforcements by riders as the telegraph was cut, from all surrounding regions. And they answered. It was lucky for the federal forces that train loads of troops from all over the northeast en route to Washington, had diverted to the area by rail the night before and had short marches to reach Jedna Junction when the call went out. Famous brigades that made their names at Gettysburg such as the Iron, Irish, 1st and 2nd Vermont, and Excalibur brigades answered the call along with the famous Michigan Cavalry Brigade, under the leadership of the boy general, George Armstrong Custer came as a gallop. Grant's leadership was shown as he deployed his forces to meet Lee's ever-stretched forces on a large wet and soggy battlefield. At Morganville Township to the east, General William T. Sherman with the Vermont Brigades consisting of 1st and 2nd Vermont Infantry Brigades, the Vermont Cavalry Brigade and the Vermont Artillery Brigade met Stuart's wing and fought them to a standstill. In the bulk of the fighting, five divisions under the hero and villain of Gettysburg, George Meade encounter his nemesis over a vast open area leaving the United Native American forces under Sioux Chief Sitting Bull to cover the western flank where they engaged Colonel John Wayton's mounted 8th Texas Cavalry at Oval's Plate Plateau on the western plains. In the northwest, Admiral James Palmer and Colonel Jacob Zelian's combined naval and marine trainee forces engaged a renegade a combined band of Tennessee mountain men and Choctaw Indians on the shores of Lake Sudi. With Lee's forces stretched so thin across a vast area and an ever-enlarging combined federal force gathering, it was only a matter of time before the rebel forces crumbled but it wasn't before six hours of bitter hand-to-hand -hand combat in an area of 18 square miles that Lee's forces retreated to one final stand. Not only now facing a force outnumbering his two TO-1 by day's end, Lee faced insubordinate from his most senior commanders in the field but in disobeying orders led fresh federal troops to the Battle of Jedna Junction, where even his brilliant tactical skills and leadership this time could not save his depleted Army of Northern Virginia from defeat. This example was proven when Colonel Watron's Texas Cavalry had disregarded orders and instead diverting federal troops in Illinois and Maryland, rode north to Jedna Junction to gain glory for himself but instead his entire troop was slaughtered by a combined Indian force forcing Lee to deploy the Texas Infantry Brigade to aid him and along with a band of rebellious school children who also involved themselves in the plot to kidnap Lincoln, but like Watron's cavalry, the Texas Infantry Brigade suffered a devastating defeat by the Native Americans south of Oval Plate Plateau. Mosby and Quantrill disobeyed orders too and resulted in a shootout with federal troops at a trading post whilst their assigned targets of stopping rail goods from reaching Jedna Junction was not conducted and fresh federal troops managed to arrive in force. Their early morning attack clearly alerted the federal troops of the gathered rebels and gave them time to prepare. Then there was Jeb Stewart who was cut off from supporting Lee's main assault at Morganville drawn into a toe-to-toe -to -toe slugging match with Sherman's Vermont brigades and eventually forced to flee back to Virginia in disarray. And then there were Lee's reserve forces at MOMO Mountains Mine that he planned to use in cooperation with Stuart's forces. What became of this force? Well the answer is a band of rebel prisoners whom had escaped from Pittsburgh prison camp in Vermont a month after being captured at Gettysburg in July and first fled to Canada 
intensifying relationships between the United States of America and the British Empire. It is reported that the escaped rebel prisoners raided the town of Cornwell on the Canadian side of the Canada-USA border, ravishing it to ashes and killing 260 civilians before fleeing back into the United States, closely pursued by a mounted colonial force from the colonies of Australia and New Zealand which could have engulfed the war into a global conflict and a third war with Great Britain. Luckily the colonial troops were more concerned in bringing the southern escapees to justice for their crimes than helping them in their cause and teamed with the Union side, engaging the escapees and rebel reinforcements at the hidden mine in the MOMO mountains. By mid-afternoon, the federal forces were converging on the Hamilton's plantation, driving the thinning rebels back. This was achieved by the timely arrival of Colonel Benjamin Grierson's three cavalry regiments whom united with General Custer's Michigan Brigade and circled to the southern side of the plantation whilst the combined federal forces under Generals Grant, Meade, and Sherman approached from the north. It was at this time that Lincoln's advisers insisted that Lincoln left Jetina Junction whilst it was safe and returned to Washington, D.C., but Lincoln refused, stating that he will not run from battle and the battle was not over yet. On the battlefield itself, the Federal forces were held back by determined rebel rearguard actions whilst Lee and his senior officers and as many troops as he could place aboard the captured Federal trains that a raid by Longstreet's men had commandeered from the nearby sidings, along with what supplies they could take, fled south through Maryland and West Virginia on a similar route he had taken when he fled Gettysburg five months before, leaving around 100 determined and hardened rebels to hold the ever-growing Federals at bay even for a hour or so. The rear guard action actually held on for an hour and a half before the few survivors, all of whom carrying some sort of wounds, throw down their weapons and surrender. It wasn't till after they were marched off for medical treatment and eventually prison that it was learned the full horrors of the Southern Way were revealed and the cause Lincoln needed to continue their fight to keep the Union as one. In a horse yard behind the main homestead, the mutilated bodies of colored soldiers buried to their necks and trampled by horses ridded over them, were discovered. Nearby white soldiers, including officers, bodies were located, all shot by firing squads. Their hands and feet all bound by rope. The Battle of Jetina Junction proved the determination of the Confederacy in their struggle and fight to keep their way of life even if it took a bitter toll on the cream of their forces in daring but vain attempt to kidnap President Lincoln and bring an end to the war. By day's end, the Confederates' casualties totaled nearly a thousand dead, wounded or captured. So if people on both sides of the North and the South wonder why President Lincoln still fights, the death of the free colored men at Hamilton's plantation should be a reminder. Our forefathers stated when they opposed the British in 1775 that all men, no matter color or creed were equal and should not be subjugated by the color of their skin, so this war is to keep the dreams of our forefathers alive and to stop the tyranny of evil and the harsh treatment of the our colored brothers of the South. This was proven yesterday at the Battle of Jetina Junction when white man united with color both black and red to defeat evil and prove they were equal in their quest for freedom to all. Susie Joe.